That's my book of Haggai. You'll find that on page 743 in your pew Bible. we are reading chapter 1, verse 1 through chapter 2, verse 9. In the second year of Darius the king, in the sixth month, on the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai, the prophet, to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Yeshua, the son of Jehoshaphat, the high priest. Thus says the Lord of hosts, These people say the time is not yet come to rebuild the house of the Lord. Then the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai, the prophet. Is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your panel houses while this house lies in ruins? Now therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, Consider your ways. You have sown much and harvested little. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages does not so put to put him into a bag with holes. Thus says the Lord of hosts, Consider your ways. Go up to the hills, bring wood, and build a house, that I may take pleasure in it, that I may be glorified, says the Lord. You looked for much, and behold, it came to little. And when you brought it home, I blew it away. Why, declares the Lord of hosts, because of my house that lies in ruins. While each of your um, busies himself with his own house. Therefore the heavens above you have withheld the dew. And the earth has withheld its produce. And I have called for a drought on the land and on the hills. On the grain and the new wine, the oil. On what the ground brings forth on man and beast. And on all their labors. Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Yeshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God, and the words of Haggai the prophet, as the Lord their God has sent him. And the people feared the Lord. Then Haggai, the messenger of the Lord, spoke to the people with the Lord's message. I am with you, declares the Lord. And the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Yeshua, the son of Jehoshadak, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and worked on the house of the Lord of hosts, their God. On the 24th day of the month, in the sixth month, in the second year of Darius the king, in the seventh month, on the 21st day of the month, the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet. Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and Yeshua, the son of Jehoshaphat, the high priest, and to all the remnant of the people, and say, Who is left among you who saw this house in its former day glory? How do you see it now? Is it not a nothing in your eyes? Yet now be strong, O Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. O be strong, O Yeshua, son of Jehoshaphat, the high priest. Be strong, all you people of the land, declares the Lord. Work, for I am with you, declares the Lord of hosts, according to the covenant that I made with you when you came out of Egypt. My spirit remains in your midst. Fear not, for thus says the Lord of hosts, yet once more in a little while I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land, and I will shake all nations so that the treasures of all nations shall come in. And I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, and the gold is mine, declares the Lord of hosts. The latter glory of this house shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place I will give peace, declares the Lord of hosts. This is the word of God, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Thank you, Jim. So I uh, was scrolling through my Facebook app on my phone the other day, and this advertisement popped up, and the title of the advertisement said, Six Things to Do If You're Barely Scraping By 
financially. I'm like, oh, okay, this looks interesting. So uh, if that's you today, maybe you're here today and finances are tight, well, you're in luck because I'm going to give you six tips from financebuzz.com on how to help you get out of your financial strapness. Ready for this? Here we go. Number one, earn up to $200 every time you play and win the game Solitaire Cash. Literally, you could just get this video game and play Solitaire, and there's a chance that you might win $200. That's number one. Number two, get the City Simplicity card and pay no interest on balance transfers until 2025. Do you hear that? You get that card, you have to pay interest for like, uh, that's how long is that, folks? May 2025? That's a long time. It's unbelievable. Number three, ask the company National Debt Relief to pay off your credit card debt. Fantastic. Number four, get this, $200 cash reward bonus with the Wells Fargo Active Card. You got to get that card, folks. You got to get that card. If you're strapped for cash, you got to get the Wells Fargo Active Card. Number five, this is my favorite. Get paid $40 every time you win the incredible bingo game. Bingo cash. Who likes bingo? Raise your hand. Raise your hand. You like bingo. That's my, I know my wife. She loves bingo. Honey, 40 bucks. You can win 40 bucks when you play this game. Come on, man. Get your bingo game on. And number six, get the choice home warranty. Folks, if you're strapped for cash, six tips on how to get out of that financial strapness. Today we're continuing in our series on the Minor Prophets, a series called Who You Callin' Short. It's a series on the Minor Prophets, which are a collection of books in the Old Testament, 12 books, uh, and, and we're calling it Who You Callin' Short because these are 12 books that are often overlooked. And they're overlooked for a number of reasons. They're overlooked because they comprise the final 12 books of the Old Testament. Uh, they are overlooked uh, because they are relatively short books. Remember last week when we did Obadiah, we literally covered the entire book. So it's short. You can easily kind of skip over it. So these are books that are often overlooked. But the burden of this series is to demonstrate that these minor prophets pack a major punch. That if we will glean what these prophets have to say for us, even just the one simple truth from each of these minor prophets could literally change your life. Okay, And so what I want to look at here is, again, the book of Haggai, and there is one simple truth that emerges from this book. It's very straightforward, very simple once we see it from the text, but here's really what it is. Okay, here we go. Put God first in everything. That's it. That's what the book of Haggai is about. Haggai is exhorting the people in his day and then exhorting us to put God first in everything. A little background here. Uh, Haggai prophesied in the late 6th century B.C. Uh, this particular prophecy comes to us from the year 520 B.C. We can pinpoint it uh, very specifically because it tells us. It says in the, uh, what does it say, the second year of Darius, Darius was the king of Persia, and we have a lot of information about him. We're able to date that, so it would have been 520 B.C. Now, many of you remember from last week when we looked at, uh, was it last week? I'm getting him confused. But when we looked at Obadiah, and we saw what was Obadiah about, well, Obadiah took place and talked about a season in the life of the people of Israel in the early 6th century, uh, around 586 B.C., when the Babylonians came in, and they destroyed the southern kingdom, destroyed Jerusalem, destroyed the temple. They exiled, meaning they deported, they, they sort of captured thousands of Judahites, the, the, the people of Judah living in and around Jerusalem. And they shipped them out, exported them, and resettled them throughout the Babylonian, uh, throughout the Babylonian Empire. Okay, uh, but then, and then uh, about, what would it be, something like, well, let's see. In 539 B.C., so you can do the math, that was 586. Then in 539 B.C., the Persian Empire conquered the Babylonian Empire. And the, the Persians had a very different approach to foreign policy than the Babylonians did, right? Uh, the Babylonians were very strict. Uh, the Persians were a little more lenient. I, 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 liked, I use this uh, analogy when I teach this Old Testament class. Um, I, I will say that that the people of Israel, if you think about the nation of Israel and throughout, uh, throughout much of their existence, you can kind of compare them to being like uh, a little boy 
whose mother keeps remarrying. And every time she remarries, she, she you know, marries a different man, and a new stepdad comes in with totally different rules on how to, to run things, right? So maybe the first stepdad comes in, and he's incredibly strict, right? He takes away the kid's iPhone, and he insists on an early curfew, and there's no video games there. Maybe he's verbally abusive. Maybe he's even physical at times, and this is the way he kind of keeps control in the house. Uh, but then, then the, the little boy's mom remarries, and a new stepdad comes in, and his approach is totally different, right? He's like the cool stepdad, right? He's the one who, who buys the kid a new iPhone and, and lets him stay up late at night, maybe even plays video games with him, okay? Uh, and that way, now the, the little boy doesn't rebel against him because he likes him, all right? Now, if you use that analogy, that's the difference between the Babylonians and the Persians. The Babylonians, they were the strict stepdad who used their authority and their, uh, and their strength and their power to dominate over whoever they conquered. Whereas the Persians, they were more like the, the benevolent, uh, benevolent authority, the, 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 the fun stepdad. And in fact, it's interesting, when the Persians finally did conquer Babylon and came into the city of Babylon, many Babylonians were happy about it. Like, we'd rather have this Persian guy than, than our own Babyl- uh, Babylonian king because the Persians were kind of the, the cool stepdad. And so when King Cyrus from Persia came in in 539, conquered the Babylonians, then he reversed all of these strict policies, and he allowed the people who had been exiled from Judah to return to Jerusalem, and he allowed them to rebuild the temple. He, in fact, he even gave back the different furnishings that, that were in the temple uh, that the Babylonians had taken. He gave them back. said, go back, rebuild your temple. I'm here to support you and all this. Okay, so in 539 B.C., they came back. They start rebuilding the temple. But as they're building the temple, they start to run into some opposition, not so much from Persia, but from the, the local, uh, local communities. And I won't get into what was going on. If you want to read about why they ran into local opposition, you can read this in the book of Ezra, which chronicles it. But they, they ran into obstacles, and the, the building of the temple uh, was halted. Okay, But now it's 20 years later. Now we're in 520 B.C., and all of the reasons that they had for not building the temple are no longer there anymore. And yet, they still are not building the temple. So it's into that situation that the prophet Haggai comes and delivers this prophecy. We see this here in verse uh, 2 of chapter 1. Thus says the Lord of hosts, These people say the time has not yet come to rebuild the house of the Lord. Right? They're procrastinating. They're like, I know we should build the temple. We'll, we'll get to that. It, it's on the list, right? Right? Ever had like a honey-do list? Uh, and, and your husband, like, I'll get to that, honey. And he just keeps putting it off. Well, that's sort of what's going on here with the people of Israel. Uh, the, building the temple's on their list, but they just keep putting it off. And they no longer really have a good reason to keep putting it off. And so then here, this leads to uh, verses 3 and 4, which really just set the tone for the whole letter. It's, and here's what Haggai says. The word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet. Is it a time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses while this house lies in ruins? Now, when he mentions paneled uh, houses, uh, most scholars think that the paneling just refers to the roof, meaning you have have roofs on your your houses, which is a way of saying your own personal homes, they're complete. Like, you finished building your own homes, and yet the house of the Lord lies in ruins. And he's like, is that the way it should be? Should you have prioritized the building of your house before the house of the Lord? And so we see what the the, the principle is that undergirds this. Put God first in everything. Haggai, in line with the, the prophets, saw himself as the, one of the covenant enforcers, right? We, we've talked about them being sort of the law enforcement officers. They're there to enforce the law, the covenant, the commitment that was made between the people of Israel going back to Mount Sinai when they made this covenant with God through Moses, right? And the, at the center of that covenant was the 
Ten Commandments, this commitment, God's committed to them and they're committed to God to, to, to obey the commandments as a, sort of the basis of their relationship. And what's interesting, of course, is, is what is the very first thing that emerges in this covenant in the Ten Commandments? And we find it here uh, in Exodus chapter 20, verse 3. It says, you shall have no other gods before me. He's saying, I, I, in our relationship, I'm first. I'm first before all other gods, which is another way of saying, I am first before everything. And of course, we see this principle reiterated over and over and over again throughout the scriptures that God is to be put first before everything. We find that it's a, a central theme in the ministry of Jesus. A famous verse, Matthew 6, 33 uh, seek first, seek, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. That's what you seek first. This same principle, he applies it in a, a more of a practical situation in relation to money just a few verses earlier. It says, no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. He's saying, What's going to be your priority in life? Is it the pursuit of money or is it the pursuit of God? You, you have to make a decision on what comes first. Then he applies this elsewhere in the Gospel of Luke, applies it to relationships. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoa. Now, is Jesus really saying that you're supposed to hate your family? No. This is classic Jewish hyperbole where he, he's saying it to, to shock you, right? And actually, this is where uh, Jesus is kind of channeling his own inner prophetic voice. We've seen throughout the, the prophets that they were, the prophets were sort of like the shock jocks of ancient Israel, right? They, they would say things really extreme to get your attention. And, and Jesus does the same thing here. He's not, he's not really saying you should hate your family. What he is saying, though, is that God is the priority. God is who you love above even your family relationships, your, your spouse, your children. Your, all really you, God, God is first. And then, of course, we see earlier on in Luke, it's summed up in this way. Then he said to them all, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. He uses this imagery of taking up your cross. And of course, what was a cross? It was an instrument of execution. And so it's, it's a way of saying, I'm dying to myself. I'm dying to myself and I'm prioritizing God over myself. And, and I think there's a key word here in this passage in Luke. We find this theme of taking up your cross in a number of dis different places throughout the Gospels in particular. But here in Luke, the word daily is added. Take up your cross daily. And the reason why I think that's important is because I think there are, are some of us here where well, we would say, like, well, look, I would, of course, God is first. I would die for my faith. We would say that. Some of us would say that. If someone was like, hey, you, either you have to denounce your faith or I'm going to kill you, I think, I think there are so many of us here that would be like, look, I, I will die rather than denounce my faith. And so, in other words, we have it in us to do this sort of heroic sacrifice for God. But the question is, are we willing to die daily? Are we willing to surrender ourselves and put God first in everything that we do each day? That's what Jesus is saying here in Luke. All right, what's the central theme that emerges from the book of Haggai? It's put God first in everything. So let me just ask you this question this morning. Is God first in your life? Think about all the different areas of your life. Is God first? Is God first in relationship to your money, in relationship to your, your finances? Right? And here's one way of asking this question. When you, when you think about the money that you have, and you think about money that you give to the Lord, you give for His purposes, for His kingdom, like where does that fit in to your budget? 
Uh, do, do, you, do you like, okay, well, th- this is, okay, this is how much my house costs, this is how much my car is going to cost, and, and this is how much, you know, we want to do this vacation. Blah, blah. Okay, whatever's left over, right, then I'll give that to God. What does it mean to do it first? First is like, okay, this is how much money I make. The first thing that comes out of that is for the Lord, for his kingdom. And then everything else comes after that. That's what it means to go first. Is God first in relationship to our money? Is God first in our relationships? Right? It, 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 the way you interact with your coworkers or the way you interact with your spouse or your children, are you thinking to yourself, how would God want me to act in this situation? Is that how you go about your relationships? Or is it more like, well, it, it's about what I want, it's, it's about what I want, and it's, it's about what they want too. Like, we both want the same thing, so that can't be wrong, right? Right, if we both want it, then it's got to be okay. Okay, but wait a minute, what about what God wants? Is that the priority in your relationship? Friends, is, is God first in your life? Now, this is the point where some of you are thinking, and, and, and you don't want to say it, but we're all thinking it. But you don't want to say it, uh, especially if, you like, if you're kind of religious, kind of grew up in the church, and you, know, you probably shouldn't think this thing because it sounds really unholy. But you're thinking it, so I'm just going to say it because we're all thinking it. Here's what we're really thinking. Why should I put God first? I mean, honestly, that's... There comes a point, I mean, I've been hitting you pretty hard here, put God first. And, and I think there's this natural sense, like, okay, okay, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. But why should I put God first? I'm going to give you three reasons that emerge from this text on why we should put God first. First of all, put God first because the Lord will provide for you. Put him first, because you can trust that he will provide for you. See, the, again, if we go to the historical context, the context into which Haggai delivers this prophecy, it was not an easy time for the people of Israel. They were struggling, and in particular, they were struggling financially. We see this, this emerges in verses 5 and 6. Now, therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways, You have sown much and harvested little. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages does so to put them into a bag with holes. How many of us can relate to this? How many feel like, I mean, We're working as hard as we can, and we can barely put food on the table. We can barely pay rent. This is what's going on here. This was an agricultural community, and so they're working hard in the fields, but the the crop, the production, is just not very good. They're having year after year of terrible crop years, and so no matter how hard they work, they're still barely able to make ends meet. Have you ever had this situation where you you go to to open up your wallet? I don't know if people use wallets anymore, but you open up your wallet and and there's nothing in there. And you're like, I swear, I just just put money in there just just the other day. Where where did it all, this is what it's saying. You put money into a bag, it's 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 like there's holes in the bag. The money is just disappearing. How many of us feel this way? And yet, in the midst of this, what is Haggai telling them to do? He's saying, put God first. Notice what he doesn't say. He doesn't say, you know what the solution is? Play bingo cash, right? Solitaire cash. You got to download this app, man. You're struggling financially. You can make $200 playing solitaire. You just need a balance transfer. That's what you need. He says, put God first. You see, the the truth is, and this is what Haggai realizes, is that when we are financially strapped, our tendency is to give less to God. Isn't that true? So when, when, when we face hard times, now the tendency is to pull away 
from God uh, in terms of what we give him financially and even also in terms of our time, right? It's not just I don't have money to give to God. It's I don't have time to serve the Lord, right? No, uh, no, I don't have time to read my Bible. I've got to play solitaire cash, right? Yeah, sorry, I would love to read through the Gospel of Matthew, but I got a chance to win $40 here, right? So, so when, when we're strapped financially, our tendency is actually to pull farther away from God because we don't feel like we have the time or the resources to give anything to him. And what Haggai is saying is that this is completely backwards. He says, well, if you're struggling, what you need to do above every, anything else. And he's not saying, look, you can play solitaire cash. There's, that's not a, it's not a sin. You can play solitaire cash on your phone. I don't care. But what's your priority, right? Put God first. Because there's an interesting truth that emerges from this that I think is a little bit hard for for some of us to take. But it's what comes out here. Is that oftentimes hard times are, to some degree or another, a result of the fact that we are turning away from God. This is what emerges in verses 7 through 11. Thus says the Lord of hosts, Consider your ways. Go up to the hills and bring wood and build the house, that I may take pleasure in that and that I may be glorified, says the Lord. You looked for much, and behold, it came to little. And when you brought it home, I blew it away. Why, declares the Lord of hosts? Because of my house that lies in ruins, while each of you busies himself with his own house. Therefore, the heavens above you have withheld the dew, and the earth has withheld its produce. And I have called for a drought on the land and the hills and the grain, the new wine, the oil, on what the ground brings forth, on man and beast, and all of their labors. You see this? He's saying, because you've turned away from me, I am withholding my blessing on you, and that is what is leading to your hardship. Now, at this point, we have to be careful. And we have to be careful to not read Haggai in isolation. Because it would be easy to then come to the conclusion, wait a minute, okay, so what you're saying is that if you're struggling in life, and if you're struggling financially, it's because you've turned away from God? Like there's a one-to-one correspondence. Like if things aren't going well, you've turned away from God, and God has turned away from you. And so then conversely, right, if, if you're prospering, if you're doing well, well, then that must be a sign that, that, God is, that you have God's favor, right? So in other words, the rich are the people who have God's favor, and then I guess the poor, they're the ones that God is unhappy with, right? Interestingly enough, that's precisely the perspective that Job's friends take in the story of Job. If you remember that story, Job loses everything. And, and so the, his friends, well, what's the conclusion they come to? Well, you must have sinned. You must have turned away from God. And we find the same attitude, interestingly enough, in the first century. If you fast forward to the time of Jesus, this is how the first century Jews thought as well. They're like, well, if you're rich, that shows that you're in a right relationship with God because you're blessed. And if you're poor, well, then you must have sinned or your parents must have sinned because God has turned away from you. And what's interesting is that Jesus challenges that whole perspective. In fact, he says something that almost seems contradictory. He says that it's difficult for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And the locals are like, wait a minute, I thought the rich guy was the one that was already blessed, right? So, so, so we have to see here that it's, it's not quite that simple. Jesus actually says, as we saw, was it last week? He said, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the broken. Those who are poor, those are the ones whom God is coming for. So we find this interesting tension going on in Scripture on this particular issue. So we can't read Haggai in isolation and just assume, well, the wealthy, they're, they're, they're the ones in right relationship with God. And the poor, well, the reason why they're struggling is because they've turned away from God. Okay, we can't take that as universal principle. Yet at the same time, we shouldn't discount it entirely either. In other words, when we are struggling in life, 
I think it is important to ask ourselves, okay, have I turned from God? Might God actually be withholding his blessing in order to get me to come back to him? And we've seen that time and time again throughout the prophets, that that's actually what God's judgment is all about. When God judges and he removes his hand of provision on his people, it's always for the purpose of restoration. It's to get their attention. It's to draw them back to him. So if you are going through difficult times, you might at least ask yourself, have I turned from God? Is he using this to draw me back to him? And then what Haggai is telling you is this. If you turn back to God, he will provide. Why should we put God first? We should put God first because he will provide. And of course, we see Jesus saying the same thing. The passage we already looked at, but now we can look at it a uh, broader context. What does he say in Matthew 6? He says, Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. He's saying, if you seek me first, those things that you are going after, I'm going to give them to you. I'm going to give you those things that you need. Now, that doesn't mean he's going to give you everything that you are pursuing. Did you know that if God doesn't give you something you were pursuing, it's because you didn't need it? You didn't need it. You thought you did. But if he doesn't give it to you, then it really wasn't that important. But if you pursue him, he will give you the things that you need. And, of course, this is then what emerges in verses 5 through 8 in Haggai in a passage that's somewhat similar to what Jesus says in Matthew 6. Fear not, for thus says the Lord of hosts. Yet once more in a little while I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land, and I will shake all nations so that the treasures of all nations shall come in, and I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine and the gold is mine, declares the Lord of hosts. The latter glory of this house shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And then note this. And in this place, I will give peace, declares the Lord of hosts. And the Hebrew word there for peace is the word shalom. And it's a word that, that we usually translate as peace, though oftentimes in the, in the Bible, it can be translated using a number of different words because it's a word that, that, that refers to so much more than just what we think of as peace. It's a word that refers to human flourishing in all of its capacity. So, so peace, uh, shalom, is, is physical health. Shalom is, is financial health and prosperity. It's, it's, it's uh, flourishing relationships and reconciled relationships. It's peace. You know what it is? It's all the things that we're going after. All the things that we're pursuing. He's saying that that's actually what I'm going to give you. If you'll just put me first. Why should we put God first? Because he will provide for us. That's the first reason. Secondly, second reason we should put God first. Because the Lord will empower you to do his work. Because here, here's the reality. Okay, if we put God first, meaning we're going to seek to do everything that God wants us to do, here's what we're going to discover. Doing what God wants us to do is not always easy. In fact, we run into challenges all the time. Of course, this is precisely what was going on in the time of Haggai, right? You just kind of think about the situation here. Here they are, working the fields. They're barely making ends meet. And Haggai's like, oh, hey, listen, uh, after work, I want you to come build this temple, right? I want you to, you've been working hard in the fields. I want you to come help build this building, okay, a little construction project after work. Like, you've got to be kidding me, right? Like, like it's not easy. Like, that, that, that's something that's hard to do. And the same thing is true for us. The things that God calls us to do, it's not always easy. When we seek to honor him, 
uh, in our relationships. When you're at work and you have a coworker that's just really difficult, and there would be an easy way to deal with that. <laughs> there's an easy way to handle that. And then there's the way God would want you to handle that, which is a lot harder. Right? What God's saying is, I will empower you in that. God's saying when you serve, when you serve in the church, when you serve in, in, in any way, right, I will empower you to do that which is difficult. When doing what he calls us to do, he is with us. This is what emerges in chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. In the seventh month, on the 21st day of the month, the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet. Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and to all the remnant of the people, and say, Who is left among you who saw this house in its former glory? How do you see it now? Is it not as nothing in your eyes? Now, what's going on here is he is addressing a particular issue of discouragement that is going on in the Israelite community. And, and here's what it is. So, uh, they have already laid the foundation for the temple. You go back in the book of Ezra, you can read about the laying of the foundation. And what's interesting, if you go back and read that passage in, in Ezra, is that once the foundation is laid, there's sort of a mixed response. Like on one hand, they celebrate, they're, they're cheering, they're so happy that the foundation of the temple has been laid. And yet some of them are like crying and moaning and, and they're not very happy about it. And it turns out the people that aren't very happy about it are the older folks. And the reason why they're not happy about it is because they remember the former temple. They remember Solomon's temple. They remember the temple that the Babylonians burned and destroyed. And what they remember is that it was much bigger than this little temple that's being set up now by Zerubbabel. And so they're discouraged by this. They remember this former time when things were greater. I think we can see the same thing today. Isn't it easy for us? in ministry or in life to look back at different times in history, maybe even the history of your own church. Like, boy, remember when this was, and we look back to former glory, and, and we can be discouraged even when good things are happening in our lives, right? The Haggai is speaking into this discouragement. It's really easy to be at that point, like, I don't even, I don't even, know, I don't know why I'm doing this. Why bother? Right? That's what they're thinking. They're like, look, even if we get this temple built, it's still nothing compared to Solomon's temple. Why would I even bother doing this? Ever been in that situation where something you had before in life was so much bigger, so much better, and now you're just working really hard to, where even though you know what you're going to get is going to be nowhere near as great as it was before, so you get discouraged. But here's what Haggai's saying. He's saying, if you do what God calls you to do, I will be with you. I will empower you. And that's actually a bigger deal than anything else. We see this here, verses 4 through 5. Yet now be strong, Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Be strong, O Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Be strong, for, be strong, all your people of the land, declares the Lord. For I am with you, declares the Lord of hosts, according to the covenant that I made with you when you came out of Egypt. My spirit remains in your midst. Friends, I think there's a really important principle that emerges here. And here's what it is. Doing hard things with God is easier than doing easier things without him. Like at, the, at the end of the day, this is what you're going to find. Is that doing hard things with God is, is actually easier than doing easy things without Him. This is the beauty of being empowered by the Spirit of God. When you are walking in obedience with God, He enables you to do things with a power and a strength that you never would have had. And so this is what Haggai is saying. He's promising, he's saying, put God first, because when He calls you to things, He will be with you. And even if it's hard, ultimately it'll be easier than doing things where he's not with you. Why should we put God first? Well, first of all, the Lord will provide. Secondly, God will empower you to do his work. And thirdly, 
The work you do for the Lord is part of something much bigger. This is a theme we're going to develop more fully next week when we look at Zechariah. Uh, Zechariah and Haggai have similar themes. There's a reason for this. They were sort of ministry partners ministering at the same time. So there's a lot of similar themes there. We're going to explore this more. But here's what it is. The work that you do for the Lord is part of something much bigger. Uh, Here in verse 9, he says something rather curious. He says, the latter glory of this house, meaning this unfinished temple here, the latter glory of this house shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place I will give peace, declares the Lord of hosts. All right, so he's saying that the glory of Zerubbabel's temple, the second temple, is actually going to outshine Solomon's temple. Now, that's a pretty curious thing to say. And subsequent history in, in one respect, also shows it to be a very curious thing to say. Because what's interesting is that right here, the, the building of the second temple, it, it's actually sort of the end of the Old Testament era. After, uh, as we're almost at the end of this series, right? Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi is the last book in the Old Testament. We get sort of a passing reference to the temple there. And then it just ends, and we have 400 years where it was recognized that the Spirit of God was not speaking through the prophets 400 years. And so you're kind of wondering, well, what is he talking about? When is is this glorious moment for Zerubbabel's temple going to come? Well, we get an interesting hint, an interesting clue in verses 6 through 8. For thus says the Lord of hosts, Yet once more in a little while, I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land. And I will shake all nations so that the treasures of all nations shall come in. And I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine and the gold is mine, declares the Lord of hosts. The latter glory of this house shall be greater than the former, says the Lord. And in this place, I will give peace, declares the Lord of hosts. Okay, what do we have here? We have apocalyptic imagery going on here. He talks about the shaking of the heavens, the shaking of the earth, the sea, and the dry land. And the question is, of course, well, where do we find this kind of apocalyptic language used and fulfilled? And we find it in a very interesting place. We find it, well, ultimately we find it in two places. The coming of Jesus and the coming of the new Jerusalem. Look here in Matthew chapter 27. Here is a curious passage, because here we have Jesus being crucified. Jesus is on the cross, and notice what it says here. Notice what happens. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And the earth shook, and the rocks were split. The tombs were also opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the Holy Spirit and appeared to him, uh, appeared to many. When the centurion who, uh, and those who were with him, keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and what took place, they were filled with awe and said, truly, this was the Son of God. Right? Well, when does God shake the earth? When does God shake the heavens? It's with the crucifixion of Jesus. And, of course, what's interesting is what happens. The temple, uh, the veil of the temple, the curtain is torn. And the, the tearing of that curtain symbolized that God had forgiven his people. That the the veil to the temple was there, the curtain was there to separate us from God because of our sin. We're not able to be in the presence of God. And now, because of Jesus' death on the cross... Because he has absorbed our sin and offered us forgiveness, now we are able to enter into the presence of God. And what is it that symbolizes that? Again, it's the tearing of the curtain of the temple. And guess what temple that was? It was the very temple 500 years before these poor Judahites were called to build. It got renovated by Herod and became a much bigger project later, but it was still the same temple. So when you read Haggai in light of Jesus' crucifixion, you see what this is saying. What they were working towards was something so much bigger than they ever could have anticipated. Friends, what we do now 
builds towards the age to come. What we do now, anything that you do now for the Lord is something that will carry on into eternity. Think about that. I mean, think about work satisfaction. Right? We all want to, we all want work satisfaction, right? We all want to do something that seems like it has some sort of meaning or purpose to it. Friends, anything that you do in obedience to the Lord has eternal ramifications. Anything that you do for the Lord will ultimately be taken up in the kingdom that is to come. Friends, why should we put God first? Three reasons. He will provide for us. He will empower us to do whatever it is He calls us to do. And thirdly, what we do is part of something much bigger. We now come to our time of communion.